You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Willkommen, Herr Anklevich. Welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2. Two. Number 1. Page 4. Once again, I'm your host, Rish Outfield. And I am Big Anklevich, not a host. That beeping monstrosity in the corner. R-O-8-O-T. And the smoking monstrosity just outside the room. What is this? Do you want to say it again, or is that good? I'm an answer man. Welcome to everyone. Thanks. I don't believe it, man. Thanks for coming. This is our second year. Yeah, it's crazy. I believe today's episode is The Edge of the Map by Ian Creasy. Ian Creasy lives in Yorkshire, England. He began writing when rock and roll stardom failed to return his calls and has now sold about 40 stories to various magazines and anthologies. The Edge of the Map originally appeared in Asimov's Science Fiction, June 2006. He has a website at iancreasy.com where you can hear audio recordings of several of his other stories. Emma Dewberry reads today's story for us, and our music today is by On Classical. Check out the links in the show notes. The Edge of the Map by Ian Creasy. Susanna listened resentfully to the helicopters spraying nanocams over the foothills. She kept her gaze locked on the plantation, rubbing her neck tensely as she waited to get the shot. It was a long time since she'd filmed her own footage. She fiddled with the controls on her ancient glasses, practicing framing the scene, zooming in, panning back for a wide angle. How long will this take? Asked Ivo. This isn't what I'm here for. We need to head off soon. In her peripheral vision, she saw him twitch restlessly as he kept glancing in all directions, like a nervous bird in a garden full of cats. I want to film a few things before I'm finally obsolete, Susanna said. It shouldn't be long now. She saw no sign of movement downhill. The cannabis plants, which had grown four meters tall in the African sun, might still harbor a few defiant hippies. Should she move along the ridge for a better angle? A bar of green light split the sky in two. The crack of ionized air rolled across the mountain like a man-made thunderbolt. Susanna adjusted her glasses, zooming in to focus on the flames. The smell of burning cannabis rode up the hillside. She gave the glasses to Ivo, and then walked a few steps down the hill. Keep looking at me, but film as much fire behind me as you can. Ivo donned the glasses with little enthusiasm. He brushed aside the fringe of his ash blonde hair, and then gave her a perfunctionary thumbs-up sign. Susanna stood up straight, took two deep breaths, and raised her voice over the crackle of the flames. As the blind spot shrinks, more secrets are revealed. Another zap echoed around the hills. When the nanocams found a drugs plantation, American satellites fried it. A gust of wind fanned aromatic smoke toward her, and Susanna suppressed a tickle in her throat. She wiped her brow with the sponsored sweatband. I can smell the burning from here. With the sun and the fire and the lasers from the sky, I'm roasting like an ant under a magnifying glass. She included these sensory details to emphasize that she reported from the spot, unlike all the bloggers who'd comment on the nanocam footage from the comfort of their own homes. In the last few days, soldiers have arrested dozens of terrorists as soon as the cam spotted them. But who else and what else is still out there? She left a dramatic pause before signing off. This is Susanna Monroe reporting from Zaire. Now she let herself cough volcanically. Her eyes watering, she stumbled up the bare slope, following Ivo to his battered Land Rover. The vehicle, 
parked in the shade of a huge rock, was a blessed harbour from the heat and smoke. I both started the engine and turned up the air conditioning, then returned her glasses with a grimace of distaste. Thanks, Susanna said, smiling. They won't bite you. It's not me I'm worried about, Ivo said, and she felt that he only barely refrained from adding, Oh, chap. Despite the heat, he wore a formal shirt and waistcoat as if he was starring in a 20th century movie about a 19th century explorer. Susanna played the recording. The obsolete glasses pixelated the image on zoom shots, and Ivo had jiggled his head while filming her. But the segment was usable. Watching her spiel, she winced at the sight of her grey hair. The last time she had used these glasses, or their backup system, her hair had been pre raphaelite red. And in those days, simple moisturizer had kept wrinkles at bay. Throughout the past week, she had felt the tropical sun beating through her high-factor sunblock, scouring crevices in her skin, tanning it like old leather. But that hardly mattered now. There would be no more stories after this one, no more dispatches from the field. The advancing nanocams made images accessible to everyone and frontline journalism redundant. A black helicopter roared overhead, spraying its invisible cargo. Inside the Land Rover, both their comps beeped to signal net access. Susanna plugged in her glasses, uploading all the footage recorded this morning and last night, when the doomed hippies had got high for the last time, vowing that the man could have their joints when he pried them from their cold, dead hands. She sent the updates to various channels she freelanced for, then began scanning her mail. Ivo interrupted. That's where we're going, he said, pointing to a map on his laptop screen. An overlay showed nanocam coverage at 98%, and the blind spot shrank by a few more pixels as she stared. Are you ready? He asked. Forward, forward, let us range. Susanna hesitated, thinking of the desperate criminals who could still be out there, hiding from the advancing cameras. If she met them, she might be giving them their last chance to commit rape, torture, murder. And yet this was her last chance too, her last opportunity for an old-fashioned scoop, here on the continent where scoops began, when New York Herald reporter Henry Stanley said, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. She nodded. Let's go. Ivo revved the engine, and the Land Rover shot forward into the glare of the sun. Susanna's comp chirped in indignation as they left the net behind and re-entered the blind spot. She read the mail she downloaded. Her husband had sent her a happy birthday message in case she'd stayed out another week. Her daughters were baking cookies. Chocolate for Michelle and almond for Vanessa. In the background, the kitchen looked like chaos, as always, and she saw Toby scooping chocolate dough from an abandoned mixing bowl. Susanna took off her glasses and put them in the pockets of her once white blouse, now stained with sweat and smoke and dust. The children, she thought, the children were one reason she had stopped chasing stories across the globe. But it wasn't just that. It had seemed a promotion to become the anchor woman in the studio, to become an armchair pundit filing expert opinions from home. And yet as the nanocam spread, everyone became a pundit. Anyone could bookmark footage and post comments, edit montages and record a voiceover. Susanna had once been proud to call herself a journalist, but the label meant nothing now. Well, the bloggers weren't out here, breathing the parched air, clutching a broken seatbelt as the Land Rover bumped over stones and fallen branches. There was hardly any trail, just a network of goat tracks and dry stream beds. Ivo zigzagged up the mountain, leaving the contour-hugging helicopter behind. The nanocams could only advance slowly and methodically, needing to knit together in a network. From their inception as an anti-terrorist measure in the USA, they had spread remorselessly across the world. War and disease had kept this remote corner of Africa clear, a haven for the hunted, but now the last blind spot would disappear. Ivo's laptop predicted, in less than two days. She watched Ivo drive. Every few minutes he turned his head for a sudden glance out of the side window, as though trying to catch something by surprise. What are you looking for? she asked. We've been through this already, he said. I'm not telling you what could be out there. The power of suggestion might make you imagine anything I mentioned. I'm bringing you because I need an independent pair of eyes. You're the journalist, shouldn't you see for yourself? Susanna thought of pressing him, but decided to wait. Sometimes silence created its own pressure. People gripped by an obsession, and Ivo's had brought him to the remotest corner of the earth, could rarely shut up for long. But he didn't speak again until the Land Rover crunched to a halt. 
Susanna hopped out and helped Ivo heave a dead shrub from their path. She swallowed hard, trying to relieve the pain in her left ear. They had climbed many hundreds of meters, but even in the thin air, the midday sun still broiled the landscape. The rocky hillside, cockmarked with tufts of dry grass, felt hot through her shoes as if the long extinct volcano plotted a comeback. Ivo said, Can you see anything? She paused and looked around. By the Land Rover, she saw no sign of human presence. The only movement came from a single bee darting between small purple flowers. Can you see anything in the corner of your eye? Ivo asked. Can you feel anything brushing past you, running from the nanocams like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing? He spoke with the intensity of a true believer, though she still hadn't figured out precisely what it was he believed in. Maybe you inhale too much of that burning dope, said Susanna. She hoped this might sting him into saying more, but he only shrugged and joined her back in the Land Rover. They crawled on, stopping more frequently as the slope grew rugged. Eventually, a huge jumble of boulders halted their progress. From here we walk. Susanna rummaged in her hold all. Coke? She offered. Ivo stared in disbelief. Where did you get this? There's not a bar or vending machine in 200 kilometers. When he opened the can, froth spurted out and soaked him with cola. They both laughed. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> said Susanna. I guess we're pretty high up and you just wasted about a hundred dollars worth of coke, by the way. Some guy I lifted it all in and charged me one thousand dollars for a six pack. She tried to ease open her can and relieve the pressure gradually, but she only succeeded in spraying foam out the window. Bubbles hissed as they fell on the Land Rover's sun-heated metal. Unless the Forex market's just exploded, that's a lot of money for Coke. Ivo wagged a finger in mock disdain. And it's not even chilled. Yeah, she sighed. It was my little nostalgia trip. Back in the old days when there were dozens of reporters chasing every story, we used to compete to see who could get the most outrageous item through expenses. She remembered Pink Slip Pete, the BBC veteran who'd mentored her through early assignments. He would have applauded the thousand dollar coke and topped it with some ludicrously expensive taxi or minibar tab. Pete had died before the newsroom started sourcing all their pictures from the nanocams. Ivo clinked his can with hers. Cheers. He started checking the contents of his rucksack. Are you going to hump your bag up the rest of the hill? He asked. Susanna frowned. How far is it? The more you carry, the farther it'll feel. She hefted the hold all, which contained exactly what she used to pack in the old days. I'll give her my best shot. Fair enough. Ivo pointed to her blouse pocket. But you're leaving those behind. Susanna pulled out the thick framed glasses. These? Why? Because they're a camera. Okay, they're, they're not the nanocams, but they're a camera nonetheless. Why do you think I'm here in the blind spot? I don't know, you won't tell me what you're looking for. No. But the reason I'm looking here is that there are no cameras. Not yet, anyway. Ivo looked up as if to check for helicopters, but silence shrouded the mountain. And that's why you can't bring your glasses. But I'm a journalist, Susanna said. When I find the story, I need to film it. Ah, but what I'm looking for can't be filmed. She turned to stare at him. Run that by me again? Ivo drained his can of warm coke. In ancient times, he began, when people made maps, they wrote here be dragons at the edge and drew sea monsters in the ocean. Over the centuries, the dragons got pushed back and back. Even in the scientific era, people still saw strange sights. Giant apes, rains of frogs, lights in the sky, fairies at the bottom of the garden. All sorts of stuff, but with one thing in common. They didn't show up too well on film. When the nanocams blanketed North America, you didn't hear much about Bigfoot anymore. So, there are two possibilities. Anyone who ever saw anything weird was mistaken or lying. Or all those weird things retreated from the cameras, just as expanding civilization has always made wildlife retreat. Or die out, Susanna said. Cheery soul, aren't you? said Ivo. Yes, many creatures have died out. But wildlife isn't all extinct. And there were so many different weird things. They can't all have died. 
just as those witnesses can't all have been wrong. So we're looking for Bigfoot? She said, pleased to have finally winkled out Ivo's obsession, and a little amused by it. He shook his head. I knew I shouldn't have mentioned anything specific. No, unless Bigfoot managed to swim all the way across the Atlantic, it seems unlikely he's here. If he ever existed. The same applies to most of what used to be called the unexplained, before the nanocam showed exactly how rains of frogs occurred. But if there's anything left, if there's just one single weird thing left in the world, it's right here. The nanocams have driven it back and back. And now the blind spot is the edge of the earth. And that's why you can't bring your camera glasses. The weird is like a superimposed state in quantum mechanics. When you record it, you destroy it. He said the last sentence as if it made sense. So you invited a journalist along, and now you're asking her to leave her camera behind? Fool many a flower is born to blush unseen. But what if it can only blush unseen by mechanical eyes? Then I wonder what it has to hide. Yet Susanna felt sympathetic to Ivo's bizarre request. Journalism wasn't just about taking pictures, otherwise she could have stayed at home and let the nanocams get the footage. Journalism was about being on the spot, talking to the locals, getting the real story rather than just a picture of it. Yes, she could leave her glasses behind. After all, she still had a backup system. Okay, she said, putting her glasses in the Land Rover's glove compartment. Let's go. They clambered over the boulders that had blocked the vehicle's ascent, and then began trudging the rest of the way up the mountain. Susanna kept transferring her hold all from one shoulder to the other in ever-diminishing intervals as the weight grew harder to bear. She wanted to rush to the top, to get the climb over with, but found herself panting for breath in the thin air. She felt dizzy, and saw black spots floating in her vision. Were they what Ivo was looking for? When she asked, he smiled and shook his head. You're just trying too hard, using too much energy. It's easier if you take small steps. He demonstrated walking with tiny heel-to-toe steps that Susanna remembered from childhood games. Let's catch a yeti and hitch a ride, she said. Ivo disdained to reply, and climbed onwards. She followed him, grateful for the nanobots maintaining her osteoporosis-stricken bones. The sun descended the empty sky. Susanna only noticed that Ivo had stopped when she bumped into him. Take a rest, he said. From here it's easier. They'd reached the rim of the ancient volcano. Before them, a vast lake stretched as far as Susanna could see. She sat on her hold all, too tired to even speak. Ivo, ten years younger, looked just as glad to take a breather. She watched him staring out into the lake and wondered what he had expected to find. Only windblown ripples broke the surface. They couldn't afford to rest long. The sun hung low, with twilight brief in the tropics. Ivo led them round the shore of the lake crunching grey sand underfoot. Ahead stood a small hut, built from mortal stones and roofed with reeds. I scouted out a few places, Ivo explained. When the nanocams began their final push, I didn't know exactly where the last blind spot would be. But I thought the lake was a likely spot. He paused. Um, you might want to wait here for a minute. Ivo approached the doorway cautiously, and Susanna remembered that terrorists might be hiding beyond but he gave her a reassuring wave and she joined him inside. A few folding chairs surrounded a picnic table full of moldy styrofoam cups and empty Rizzler packets. Some of the hippies used to come up here for the fishing, Ivo said. They had lots of stories about the things that got away. Susanna thought he referred to drug-inspired tales until she realized that he meant weird things. What monsters might be wandering outside the stone walls? Was it safe up here? The hell with it, she thought. Bigfoot could scare off the terrorists, or vice versa. She was too tired to worry. She looked for a bed, but saw only a pile of dry reeds. From her hold all, she took some spare clothes for a pillow. Good thinking, said Ivo. We need to start early tomorrow, to beat the helicopters. If he said anything else, Susanna didn't hear it before she fell asleep. In the morning, they walked further around the lake to a stretch of tall reeds growing in the shallows. A thin layer of cloud veiled the sun, but did little to restrain its heat from baking the landscape. Ivo splashed through the reeds until he shouted in triumph. (laughs) 
Susanna stepped into the water, finding it colder than she had expected, and joined Ivo as he heaved aside a faded tarpaulin. Underneath bobbed a motorboat, its off-white interior colonized by nesting spiders. Susanna threw in her hold all and clambered onto a bench, brushing arachnids aside. Oh, the joys of location reporting. She tailed off her wet feet while Ivo struggled to start the engine. The boat roared into the lake, flattening reeds in its way. Ivo throttled back to a gentle pace. He kept glancing from port to starboard, bow to stern. Susanna saw only birds wading near the shore, taking to the air when the boat came too close. She looked away from the shore, out into the lake. Beyond the boat's wake, the still water reflected the sky. She barely saw any boundary between them. No farther shore darkened the horizon. Susanna blinked and peered into the distance. She still couldn't see anything. How big is this lake? She asked. Ivo shrugged. I haven't been round it. I thought we were in a volcano crater. Shouldn't we be able to see the other side? I'll check the map. Ivo delved into his rucksack, but when he tried to boot up the laptop, nothing happened. He shook his head. Batteries must have run out. They don't last long out here. You don't have any spares? Sure. Back in the Land Rover. Ivo looked more excited than concerned. Let's get across and have a look. He said, revving the boat like a boy racer. Susanna glanced back and watched the hut dwindle into an imperceptible speck. The loss of her only landmark disturbed her on a visceral level. You wanted to chase a story, she reminded herself. In the old days, she'd survived dozens of disturbing moments. Back then, she'd almost relished being scared, because the most uncomfortable stories sometimes turned out to be the best. In those days, of course, she didn't have a family waiting back home. The engine cut out. Shit, said Ivo. He yanked the starter. The engine coughed and grunted, but wouldn't fire. We must be out of gas. Stupid hippies! They promised me there was loads left. Susanna bent down to peer under her bench. She rejoiced at the sight of a red canister, but when she grabbed it, she could feel it was empty. Below the other bench, Ivo retrieved two long paddles. I guess this is the emergency engine. It's a long time since I did any canoeing, Susanna said. Or anything much, she thought. The motorboat was no canoe. Susanna found the benches uncomfortably placed for paddling, as did Ivo. Nevertheless... After several minutes of splashing and swearing, they found they could move the boat if they had to. Bloody hell. This made Susanna feel a little better, though she reflected that the few minutes the engine had driven them out would take a whole lot longer to paddle back. And where was back, exactly? In struggling to coordinate their paddling, they'd spun the boat so many times that Susanna had no idea which way they'd come. All directions looked the same, an expanse of water stretching to the hazy sky. The heat made her scalp itch with sweat. She opened a coke and swigged the whole can. Laptop down, engine stopped, she said. Do you reckon gremlins did it? Are they part of the weird? She wanted to bait him, to get him to talk about what he was looking for. If gremlins existed, they'd sabotage the nanocans. They haven't managed that yet, said Ivo. He raised an ancient pair of binoculars to his eyes. For long minutes, he slowly turned, scanning all angles. He peered into the depths of the lake, then shrugged and sat down. For a few moments, no one spoke. The occasional call of a faraway bird sounded as distant as if it came from another world. Susanna decided to test the backup system. She fixed her gaze upon Ivo and asked, What made you start chasing the weird? Did you once have an encounter with it? No, said Ivo. Quite the opposite. He paused to put on more sunscreen, then continued. When I was a child, I used to lie a lot. I would make up stories, tell people I'd seen strange things. My parents thought I just wanted attention, that I'd say anything to make people listen to me. Maybe it started out that way, but I didn't want to lie. I really wanted to have stories to tell, true stories of marvelous things, inexplicable sights, strange meetings. I hated living in a suburb where nothing ever happened except bikes disappearing and pets being run over. I made up stories about bicycle-napping aliens and monsters who emerged from the woods to gnaw the corpses of roadkill. Susanna nodded sympathetically, and Ivo went on. To get ideas, I read old books about strange phenomena, and I began to wonder why those things didn't happen anymore. Not in the suburbs, anyway. 
That's when I realized that maybe all the surveillance was pushing back the unexplained, driving it away. When he halted for a moment, Susanna rewound the last few seconds in her eyes. She saw Ivo speaking. She didn't hear him because she didn't have an ear implant. But her camera eyes included a tiny microphone to capture sound. When she uploaded the footage, she'd have full sound and vision. She remembered the day she'd finally topped Pink Slip Pete, when she told him how she'd persuaded the network to pay for cyber eyes as a covert backup for her glasses. The expense claim was so huge, it had to be authorized by a vice president, but her eyes had secretly captured some great stories. Then the nanocams came along and left her with a head full of obsolete hardware. This would be the last time she would ever use it. She filmed Ivo talking about all the years he'd spent in ever more remote parts of the world. The oppressive heat made his arctic adventures sound almost cozy. They both splashed themselves with water from the lake to cool down. What about you? Ivo asked at last. Is this the story you anticipated when you came to Zaire? Susanna shrugged. I was just looking for someone to take me into the blind spot. I didn't know what the story would be, and I still don't. Yours isn't the only theory about what's out here, you know. I've heard conspiracy types claim there's a secret government base beyond the cameras. There's plenty of other theories, too. Whatever people want to believe in, they find a place for. And this is the only hidden place left. Ivo scanned the horizon yet again. The occupants are staying hidden so far. He took a monogrammed snuff box from his waist pocket, extracted a mint, and ate it. What are you expecting? The last UFO to turn up and beam you away? I already said I'm not telling you what I'm expecting. You're the independent witness. Just keep watching. Susanna wondered if Ivo refused to specify his goal because he didn't know what it was, and only had blind faith in something out there. Years of failing to find it, of being narrowed down to this one final spot, must have shaken that faith. Maybe he knew in his heart that he'd been chasing a mirage. Why invite a journalist then forbid her to bring cameras? Was he planning a hoax? She didn't see how he could manage it, unless he had an accomplice somewhere out on the lake. Susanna sighed. Professional paranoia was all very well. Pete's journalistic motto had been, Why is this bastard lying to me? But Ivo's sincerity convinced her that he believed in what he searched for. She admired his commitment, his unwavering pursuit. He spent years in the field, chasing his goal, while she'd stayed at home with the Teletubbies. Ivo gazed at the lake like a patient fisherman, absently twiddling with his cufflinks. Once by men and angels to be seen, he muttered to himself, in roaring he shall rise, and on the surface die. Susanna recognized the cadence of poetry, but without a net connection she couldn't identify it. Who memorized verse nowadays? A breath of wind blew across the lake, a welcome breeze in the furnace of the volcano crater. Susanna stared at the water, waiting for Atlantis to appear or Nessie to start frolicking, or whatever might manifest in front of her recording eyes. To pass the time, she mentally rehearsed voiceovers for the Nostalgia Channel. Remember Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster? You don't hear so much about them these days, but one man reckons he can track them down. For the Conspiracy Channel... The government captured Bigfoot and friends and is holding them in a secret reserve in remotest Africa. What sinister experiments are they performing on harmless yetis? The searing heat had given her a headache. She swallowed an aspirin along with her lunch of a low-fat cereal bar. Should we make a move? She asked at last. We're not seeing a damn thing sitting here. We're certainly not, said Ivo, frowning. The weird flees from cameras. Yet here we are, in a camera-free zone. The only camera-free zone on Earth. And it still hasn't showed up. I wonder why that is. You left the glasses behind, but you wouldn't happen to have brought any other cameras, would you? Susanna stared at him, her cyber eyes filming 24 frames per second. A surge of fear made her tremble. If she admitted that her eyes were cameras, what would he do? Ivo's single-minded quest might make him do anything to reach his goal, anything to someone who threatened it. She felt acutely vulnerable, alone on the lake with this burly stranger. Years of living under the nanocams had made her feel safe. Crime had plummeted under their surveillance. And now, she had abandoned their protection for someone with a weird obsession. She pondered whether to lie to him, to say she had no other cameras, and yet as a journalist she hated being lied to. 
She was committed to finding the truth. So how could she lie? All these thoughts whirled through her mind while Ivo waited for her to answer. At last, she nodded. Yes, I've been using a backup camera. I'll turn it off if I have to, I promise. Ivo stared at her. Susanna realized that he'd wanted to see her turn off the camera, so he knew she'd done it. So he knew where it was. She couldn't bear to tell him that the cameras were her eyes. He might rip them out of her head. Look, out there! She shouted. He turned round and squinted at the calm surface of the lake. What? He demanded. What did you see? I'm not telling you, she replied. The power of suggestion, remember? We're making independent observations. Indeed we are said Ivo, his voice full of skepticism. By not claiming to see anything in particular, Susanna hadn't actually lied. She heard so much spin as a journalist, she could spin herself when she had to. And yet... Look! She said again. This time she pointed. A faint patch of mist hung over the water. The game's afoot, Ivo said. We need to get over there. You ready to paddle? Uh, yeah... Susanna didn't feel quite as much enthusiasm as the prospect ought to inspire. The fog seemed to thicken as she gazed at it. What was out there anyway? The Flying Dutchman? Then let's go! Ivo said impatiently. Susanna sat port and aft, with Ivo diagonally opposite. Together they slowly paddled across the lake. The mist approached faster than their paddling speed, as if the fitful wind blew it toward them. Now a whole bank of fog stretched across the water like a cloud fallen from the sky. Just before they reached the whiteness, Susanna shipped her paddle. Ivo swore as his strokes, now in balance, sent the boat spinning. They slipped sidewards into the fog. The cool mist made Susanna grateful for a respite from the heat. Inside the fog, visibility fell to a few meters. They floated in a cotton wool cocoon, silence pressing upon them. Susanna peered around to see what might be looming in the mist. The minutes passed slowly. Ivo drummed his fingers on the side of the boat, and then stopped. Susanna saw nothing, heard nothing. She sniffed the air but smelled only their own sweat. She remembered her promise to turn off her backup camera, but she hadn't filmed with her eyes for years and had forgotten exactly how they worked. Now she recalled that they recorded continuously on a seven-day loop. Was her gaze repelling weirdness? Ivo certainly thought so. There was probably nothing out there, she thought, but if there was, right now, it didn't even have a chance to show up. She felt sorry for Ivo, about to have his dreams shattered when the nanocams finally covered the whole earth. All his years of dedication would be wasted, all those years he'd spent out in the field while she sat at home spouting punditry and interviewing spin doctors. Didn't Ivo deserve a chance at his story? Didn't he deserve it more than she? who had abandoned journalism for a decade and even now hadn't fulfilled the promise she'd just made. Her cameras had been staring for hours and not seen a damn thing anyway. Susanna took two deep breaths, and then she closed her eyes. Immediately, the silence developed texture. She heard the faint swish of water around the boat, the quiet creak of her bench as tension made her muscles twitch. She smelled dampness in the air, tasted moisture on her tongue. Her skin crawled. Or maybe it was just the spiders. After barely a minute, the urge to open her eyes grew so strong she had to clap her hands over her face. She began counting seconds under her breath, trying to calm down. But she kept imagining the fog closing in, crushing the boat. When I get to 100, she promised herself, I'll do something. At 100, she set herself the goal of reaching 200. At 157, she couldn't stand it anymore. Can you see anything? She asked, trying not to sound like a gibbering wreck. Ivo? He didn't answer. Susanna counted more rapidly, gabbling through the rest of the numbers. At 200, she opened her eyes. Her companion had vanished. Ivo! She shouted. Her voice sounded thin and muffled. The mist had surged. No, it had only thickened. Susanna told herself desperately, so that she could barely see past the end of the boat. She peered over the side, wondering if Ivo had fallen into the lake, though she would surely have heard a splash. Frantically, she scoured the water with the paddle, half hoping and half fearing to prod his body. But all around, as far as she could reach, she only disturbed the smooth, dark depths of the lake. 
Ivo! She strained her ears for any reply. Ripple slapped the boat with a whispery susurration. Lift not the painted veil which those who live call life. Was that Ivo's voice, or just her remembrance of his dusty quotations? Where are you? she cried. The fog swallowed her voice as it had swallowed him. He had found the weird at last. Maybe they had fled to another world and he had managed to follow them. Or maybe they had resented his long chase and dealt with him. As the mist swirled around the boat, Susanna felt that if it came any closer, it would envelop her and take her away. If it touched her, she would disappear like Ivo. No, her eyes would protect her. Hadn't Ivo said that the weird couldn't appear on camera? All she had to do was keep looking and she'd be safe. And yet, she didn't have eyes in the back of her head. The fog could creep up behind her. Something could reach out and grab her. She whirled around. Nothing there, of course. Just more fog. Was it closer? She turned her head from side to side, trying to cover all angles. She heard the harsh sound of her own panting breath. Then she heard something else. A muffled roar high in the sky. A monster was coming. Here be dragons. She had sailed off the edge of the map. And then she recognized the sound of a distant helicopter. She had never been happier to hear any noise in her life. She waited for it to come closer, for the nanocams to save her. The drone faded. The fog was going stronger, swallowing all sound, swallowing everything within it. Susanna started paddling frantically, chasing the faint whir of the helicopter. The boat moved, but kept slewing to port. Ivo! She shouted again. Yet she knew he had gone. She struggled to recall her canoeing lessons to remember how one single person could steer a straight line, even paddling on one side of a boat. How? How? J-shaped strokes. Susanna paused, took two deep breaths, and paddled furiously but with more effect. She followed the helicopter's siren song. Tendrils of fog brushed across her face, then dissipated. She could see further ahead. Looking up to the sky, she thought she glimpsed the copter. Or maybe something else was out there. Susanna paddled faster, gasping with exertion. A noise inside the boat made her heart skip, and then she realized it was her comp, beeping to indicate net access. The nanocams had arrived. She stopped paddling, knowing she had reached safety. Looking back, she saw only thin wisps of fog, shredding and fading into the wind. No sign of Ivo. How had he disappeared? Had there ever been anything weird out there? If so, she hoped he was happy to join his friends, his large, hungry monster friends. Maybe Ivo would just search for weirdness so hard that finally, in disappearing, he became the mystery that he had longed for. Susanna smiled. Certainly she had got one final old-fashioned scoop, an epitaph for the end of strangeness in the Nanocam's world. The mysterious disappearance of Ivo the Weird Hunter. The Conspiracy Channel would love it. Author's Note Hello, I'm Ian Creasy. The story you've just heard was inspired by my fondness for the magazine Fortean Times, which discusses all sorts of strange phenomena, UFOs, Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, ghosts, time slips, alien big cats, and anything that doesn't fit neatly into what we might call orthodox reality. Fortean Times is an admirable publication because it doesn't uncritically endorse any of those phenomena, but neither is it a dismissive debunker. Instead, the magazine simply sets out the evidence, or lack of it, and allows readers to make up their own minds. When you see a lot of this stuff, certain patterns emerge. Weird things tend to happen in remote areas. Photographs are never quite definitive, and evidence is always elusive. It's as if the weird is something that by definition can't be captured on camera, something that exists only in the spaces at the edge of the map where they used to write, here be dragons. 
And as civilization expands and the world fills with surveillance cameras, the weird is pushed back and back. So what happens when there's no space left at the edge of the map? That's the question that sparked the story. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, welcome back. Thanks for listening to the story. I hope you liked it as much as I did or as much as Rish did. Either or. Either or. Jeez. Philistine. Good night, everybody. This has appeared in Asimov's. Has, Has that happened to us before? I'm not sure, but I don't think so. Asimov's is the big one, right? It's one of the big three, as someone recently uh, referred to them. Um, Which is Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Am I right? uh, Okay. Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, or F and SF, as you hipsters (laughs) like to say. Asimov's and Analog. See, Asimov's and Analog, I know for sure. F and SF, and uh, gosh, I wanted to say that there was another one of the big three, which would make it four. If there is another one out there, let us know. So Doonstief isn't one of those three. Uh, Doonstief is on the bottom three list. <laughs> oh, uh, that's the big three we're a part of. Yeah. It's, and awesome. it's kind of cool because we're not always dead last. Sometimes that rotates. We have been as high as fourth worst venue for fiction. I, 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 can you believe that? Fourth. Dude, that means wow. three others are crappier than us. Nice. And we are on our way up. Well, I mean, currently we are at number two, but <laughs> but someday we're moving on up to the top. Though. That's right. We're going to enter that top one hundred someday. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I the day that we recorded this, I had seen a Connery movie, a Sean Connery movie, but it was a pre Lisp Connery before today. We sailed into history. It was before we had any of that madness with the poor man. And uh, <laughs> sorry, did I just slam Sean Connery? Right. He's a handsome you, man. You, I would slam him. loved him enough that he could deal with a bit of slamming. That's right. Slamming Sammy Sosa. Are you going somewhere with this, guys? We have derailed. <laughs> Thank so. you, announcer man. This conversation has derailed. Thank you. You always remind us so. to get back on track. And so, darn it, when we were reading through and I was doing that character, every once in a while the damn Connery would come in. And I, I didn't mean for it to. And, and you've edited the story, so you know how much of the Connery remains. Do you have a sample by any chance of me Connerying it out? Well, sure. We'll, we'll listen. take a listen to this. Ah, but what I'm looking for can't be filmed. It is becoming slightly Sean Connery. I hope that's all right. As long as I don't say filmed. Giant apes, lights in the sky, fairies at the bottom of the garden. Garden, there's Sean Connery once again. Sorry, I don't think there's anything wrong with striking a woman. Even in the scientific era. I knew I shouldn't have mentioned anything specific. It's not, especially not to a woman. You need a good slapping. I can't un Sean Connery. I mean, I'm seeing him in my head now. No, unless Bigfoot managed to swim all the way across the Atlantic, it seems unlikely he's here. Here. Want new penny? Oh, jeez, that's worse than I had remembered. Yeah, I do recall uh, in the reading of that me having to uh, say again and again, okay, do that one more time, but without the Connery in it. <laughs> Which is fun, you know, it makes it more entertaining. Uh, another thing, today's story was read by Emma Dewberry, who... You may remember doing the voice of Catherine from uh, Lonely Hearts Club. And it's lovely sequel. Japanese motorcycle club. Soon to be followed by... Boy George and the Culture Club. Really? Is that what he's going with? Uh, I don't know. He hasn't really said yet. So anyways, yeah, Emma did a great job, I thought, with this story. It's fun to have a legitimate accent reading the story, I think. Instead of some sort of... Sean Connery lisping accent. A monster, man. <laughs> I thought that Connery had somehow de-aged and was right there. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, helping us out with that story, Emma. But yeah, you had liked this story substantially, I think, when you first read it. Probably because it has a lot to do with unexplained occurrences going on there. And these, you know, these nanocams have 
driven away the unexplained occurrences except for maybe in those little blind spots that uh, haven't been seen and unexplained occurrences i think are a bit of a specialty of yours one of those things that you're kind of really into yeah you're totally right i have a lot of relatives on my mom's side who believe in all sorts of wacky shite my aunt insists that she's you know seen ufos and my uncle constantly talks about bigfoot well he he is a conspiracy nut and he (laughs) says oh i'll tell you where in nevada they shot the moon landing and stuff like that anything that some crackpot believes my uncle believes you know it's like (laughs) well barack obama is actually cloned from hitler where did you hear this it only takes one crackpot to believe it and then he's on the boat yeah he's really into that stuff then i have another uncle who's super super into spirits and ghosts and possession and voices and stuff. And he tells these stories about his house that curl my hair and not just the curly kind. He tells these horrible stories where if honestly one of those stories had happened to me, I would have been like, mom, we've got to move out of this house. (laughs) Why don't people ever do that in ghost stories? They see a ghost in their house and they just keep on living with it. What is the deal with that? You said it, Big. I, I mean, and it's hard to say without sounding like a skeptic or sounding like a jerk or whatever. But he is either really susceptible to suggestion or his imagination, or he has some kind of connection to the other worlds or the what do they call it? The the, the barrier between this world and the next is you can very see thin. The veil. Yeah, it's something like that. My mom sort of believes in that stuff, but she is afraid. And my grandmother was always afraid of ghosts. She, in her broken English, would always talk about, no, the the ghosts. That was plural of ghost to my grandmother. And yeah, my mom has sort of inherited that belief, but she hasn't had the experiences that my uncle has. And she's glad she's because she's like me. If I ever saw any of that stuff, I'd be in a nut house, man. I I can't handle it. My imagination is messed up as it is yeah you just see a kid standing in your room and you're peeing your pants in fear so did we talk we did talk about that (laughs) and it it wasn't pee folks (laughs) but yeah i do really enjoy hearing urban legends or people back east call them friend of a friend stories and sasquatch sightings or crop (laughs) circles or chupacabra (laughs) I, i do like the unexplained and I like the thought that we don't have all knowledge and we can't understand everything. And there are some things that we're not meant to understand. You said it, 08 OT. And so I sort of understand the sadness of this story, of it finally all becoming clear. There's no more secrets. There's no more little niches. Yeah, it's all driven away. By damn technology, he said into a microphone recording an MP3. What are you talking about? We're recording an AIFFC file here. Why do you have to ruin everything? So, you know, we haven't been talking a long time, but I'm thinking maybe we should cut it short. Yeah, that's probably a good idea, to tell you the truth. Because both of us are headed out of town here soon. Yep, I'm going south, you're going north. Yeah. You'll be gone just for the weekend, basically, and I'll be gone for two weeks. So, wait, we're not going to have any show for two weeks? Which is not unusual for us. I'm hoping to uh, set it up so that a show drops next week at some point, like halfway through my trip. But yeah, we'll have to see how it works. I really, I've never tried it before, so we'll see how it goes. But hopefully it'll work and so people can not forget that we exist by the time we get back. So we've got next week's episode just ready to go. We recorded it before this one, put it ahead, and we figured we'd talk about this on this one, just in case it doesn't happen with next week's. Right? I don't understand. Your world frightens and confuses me. So I'm going up to Canada. Where are you headed, Rish? I'm going to the San Diego Comic Con. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm going down to Comic Con. I go every year. And uh, you, alas, are not going with me after. No, unfortunately, I'm not. But I will grill you on air about what happened there. So you folks can all look forward to a report. What went on at the San Diego Comic-Con, what Rish's impressions, not his Sean Connery impression, but his actual impressions of the show were. What happened last year and the year before, and the year before, was, and the year before, they give you all sorts of free junk. Right, yeah, that's one of the best parts about the, uh, the whole thing. It really is. There's some really cool stuff. 
Like that, that totally awesome Iron Man flash drive that we both got? Oh, you got it. I lost mine. Oh, oh, that's right. Sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up and rub salt on that wound once again. But oh, so, so what I was saying is that every year when you go to Comic-Con, they give you free stuff. There, there are hundreds. Would you say there are hundreds of booths? Or yeah, there? I think there are. Not all of them are free giveaway booths, but there's definitely hundreds of booths. And the, the major booths, like the movie studios, the comic companies, the toy studios, right. they will often have freebies or posters or bags or sometimes shirts or bumper stickers or pins or you know, prop, what, whatever cool they stuff. feel like giving away. And I don't know if there's like an, a competition between them of, you know, it's like, oh, did you see what Warners did this year? It's like, well, let's make sure that we outdo them over here at Fox next year. But... Uh, Usually there's some really cool things that are given away. And I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen this year, but we talked about it last year with all the twilight shite and <laughs> with the, you know, that you had to get a pushing daisies bag for your wife just so she could get that show canceled. And <laughs> I was thinking that maybe I could set aside a couple of things to give away to our listener. Really? And so you and I were talking and I thought, well, maybe we do a game, a contest, a I think you call it a contest. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited. Void in Nebraska as well. Yeah. So we're going to do a back and forth list of movie quotes. And then the first person to, do we want to say guess them all correctly or the person who guesses the most correctly? I think we'll say the first person to get them all correctly or if no one gets them all correctly, the person to get them most correctly will win. That way, at least we'll end up with a winner, even if everybody sucks. Well, here's the thing. We're recording this the week of Comic-Con and you won't be back until two weeks from then. Right. So how about if I post like in the comments section what it is that I'm giving away? Okay. And I'll do that sometime next week when I know what I've got. Okay. But this episode will go on the air this week. We'll have the questions. So even before you know what you're going to be getting, you can play the game if you'd like. Yeah. Just look for my post and I'll, I'll tell people what I'm giving away. Could be that I'll get greedy and want to keep everything for myself. But I mean, usually there are things that I'm, I'm not familiar with, not into. Like last year, I got a bunch of T-shirts, one for that pornographic movie Knowing, one for Push, one for Astro Boy, which still hasn't come out. One for Transformers 2, which unfortunately has come out, et cetera, et cetera. A bunch of posters for G.I. Joe, which is close to coming out. So we got a poster for Sex Drive. That's right. That's still sitting in my basement <laughs> where it belongs. So anyhow, I guess what I was trying to say is there are often <laughs> things that I don't want. I don't know what to do with. They either go into a box, they go into the garbage, or I try and sell them on eBay. And I'll, I'll try and select something that is cool. It may be there will be all sorts of cool things and we can make more games of it because you wanted to do song quotes and I wanted to do movie quotes. So maybe we'll do another game in the future. I, to me, this is fun. This is something that you and I do when we're IMing back and forth. So I hope you will enjoy this as well. OK, so I'll go first. OK, number one. Let me guess. Laundry day. Nothing clean, right? OK, number two. Here's mine. What on earth is this thing I'm wearing? Uh, this is a radiation suit. Radiation suit? Of course. Because of the fallout from the atomic wars. Uh, number three. Get busy living or get busy dying. That's damn right. Number four. That's a dorky looking helmet. What's it for? This dorky looking helmet is the only thing that's going to protect me from the real bad guys. Number five, a naked American man stole my balloons. Number six, morning, Colonel. Change your mind about that bottle? I want 600 pairs of shoes and 1,200 pairs of socks. And anything else you've been holding out on us, you piece of rat filth? Number seven. We need like one of those cool recorded Casey Kasem countdown kind of voices. Number seven. Do I the countdown this week? <laughs> Number seven. Oh, well, I've got two sevens, and two sevens beats a fresh. Number eight. Big Anklevich coast to coast. Hi there, from my neck of the woods, eh? Sorry if I took a snap at you one time. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta eat. Number nine. Number nine. You know, 
that was the time I was most frightened, waiting for my turn. I'll never put on a life jacket again. Okay, what are we on, number 10? Yes. Wow, number 10. Number 10. Please, this is supposed to be a happy occasion. Let's not bicker and argue over who killed who. All right, number 11. Live for nothing or die for something. Your call. Oh, number 12. Dear Buddha, please bring me a pony and a plastic rocket. Okay, this one you will get. Number 13. You once called me a warped, frustrated old man. But what are you but a warped, frustrated young man? Number 14. Baby talk? That's not a saying. Oh, but baby fish mouth is sweeping the nation. Number 15. Here in town, there's only she who is beautiful as me. Okay. Number 16. Incidentally, my dear, he amuses me, too. Bravo! Bravo! Yes. Number 17. Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. Presenting the high ridinest cowboy around. You forgot rootin' tootinest! The high ridinest rootin' tootinest cowboy of all time! Number 19. There's nothing more exhilarating than pointing out the shortcomings of others, is there? 20. Why do you wear a mask? Were you burned by acid or something like that? No, it's just they're terribly comfortable. I think everyone will be wearing them in the future. Number 21. Somebody blows their nose and you want to keep it? Okay, my last one, number 22. It's I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. No, I, I like to rock and roll all night and part of every day. I usually have errands. I can only rock from like one to three. 23. They made you feel cool. And hey, I met you. You are not cool. 24. You're the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. And the last one, number 25, I believe. To her, it is simply another child. To us, it is the beast. All right, so there you have it, folks. That's our uh, quotes. If you want to dash off and start Google searching them, I guess, is probably what's going to happen. Oh, don't uh, do that. If you know them, please uh, list them out, send them in. Let us know uh, what they all are. And the first person with the, all the correct answers or the person with the most correct answers will win a pr- special prize. Hey, and we're sorry about the quality of the sound. Uh, the battery's dying on us, so we're just going to quit right here. Send your responses to editor at dunesteef.com. That's D-U-N-E-S-T-E-E-F. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. We won't be able to announce the winners in next week's episode, but we'll try and do it in the one after that. That's right. Okay, so that was our show. Uh, Thanks for listening. If you made it all the way to the end, most of you I know have already shut it off. But to those who persevered... Free money for y'all. Rish, you're such an idiot. So anyways, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. You've seen hundreds, thousands of pigeons, right? Uh, Of course. Have you ever seen a baby pigeon? Well, neither have I, but I've got a hunch they exist. Thanks a lot, folks. Good night. Thank you for listening. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Here we are in a camera-free zone. The only camera-free zone on Earth. I had the cure for the plague of the 20th century and I've lost it.